thanks so much, Sandy, for being with us today. It is great and to be here. Really enjoyed your lecture Thank and you. bringing Isaiah into conversation with the creation texts. Thank you. So uh, let's just go ahead and dive right in. Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting about uh, your lecture was how you juxtaposed the uh, former times with the latter times. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how uh, Isaiah depicts God as doing a new thing. Yes. Um, and Absolutely. you brought that into conversation with the, the creation texts. And I wonder, does that, does that create a tension? Because it almost looks as if, you know, creation 1.0 didn't work. Uh, oh, does okay. God have to jump in and fix it? Okay. You know, is, this, is this plan B? Is that what God's up to in Isaiah? Hmm. I would respond generally for biblical theology that, and there are many who disagree with me, but I actually argue strongly that plan A is plan B, and that plan A was a good plan, and we don't need a new plan. And what was plan A? It was to get the people of God into the place of God uh, with full access to the presence of God. That's my little triad. Hmm. And that is what Eden is with all of the amazing realities of a perfect ecosphere and humanity who has not yet experienced a fall. So this is, this is plan A. And I would argue that if we follow the biblical theological breadcrumbs of the text, which often are icons, which I find very interesting images, that plan marches all the way forward to the New Jerusalem. And the fact that the New Jerusalem has a cosmic river and trees of life not one, but dozens, and they bear their fruit uh, in and out of season, and the leaves are for the healing of the nations, and there'll be no more death there. I read Genesis, I read Revelation 21 and 22 as the necessary and intended completion of what Genesis 1 was supposed to be. So I'm, I'm definitely a one plan kind of girl. Um, and I, I would think to uh, briefly respond that everything from Genesis 3 to Revelation 19 is a rescue plan. So in the midst of that, Isaiah is speaking. Yeah, that's really helpful. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. So um, it seems like when we think about the doctrine of creation, mm -hmm. uh, our minds immediately go to uh, the first couple chapters of Genesis. Mm -hmm. Or maybe if we're lucky, maybe the end of Job. Mm -hmm or the Psalms, mm -hmm. um, but your lecture today was really bringing out how Isaiah informs the canonical witness of the doctrine of creation. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit more about that? What do we get in Isaiah? What unique perspective and emphasis do we see that we don't necessarily get Anywhere elsewhere else. in the canon? Yeah. So I would think uh, the first part is Isaiah's uh, locatedness, his place. So he is actually standing in the midst of the rescue plan as he speaks. So whereas we've spoken before about how Eden and the New Jerusalem, I believe, go together as the great bookends of the story of redemption, mm -hmm. he's right smack in the middle. And so his place is living in the midst of an Israel that he knows, both by experience and prophetic vision, is going to fail. They will fail as a servant of God. And this is not going to be the end of the story. And standing in his place, he also sees the future. And uh, his future is still misty, but he knows that there's going to have to be a resurrection of this people. And how is that going to happen? So in his place, he, you know, standing in 8th, 7th century Judah, he is looking all the way back to the foundational principles, theologies of his people. And he's looking ahead to what he knows his God is up to, even if he doesn't fully understand it. And he's writing that back into his people's experience. So that's very important. I think his intellect is very important. We have a man who is brilliantly educated. He is reading the Babylonian text. This is obvious. He's quoting uh, Assyrian monumental inscriptions in his critique of Sennacherib. He's quoting Sennacherib's inscriptions back to Sennacherib when he disses him in chapters 36 through 39. It's, it's fabulous, especially if you like, you know, live TV. It's fabulous. So it's like he, it's like he knows 
what the Assyrian propaganda machine is yes. spitting out and he's throwing it back at them. Yes, yeah. and saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah, yeah you, you think you've got some amazing conqueror of the free world? Wait till you meet Yahweh. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, uh, situatedness, intellect is huge. But I want to I hear more of that question. Um, what is distinct about the creation narratives in Isaiah? Ask that part again. Yeah, so uh, what do we get there um, in terms of how creation theology plays itself out in terms of what Isaiah is up to? Okay. Um, so, for example, in your lecture, um, one of the key components was Isaiah's polemic against idolatry. Mm -hmm. um, and he leverages his, so it, for Isaiah, his creation theology isn't just this preface mm -hmm. uh, that um, he has to start with. And then, well, let's, then the heavy theological balls get rolling. Okay. Um, but it actually uh, plays a major role in his polemic against the idols. Okay. Um, so uh, in what ways does Isaiah um, fill out the canonical witness? Okay. Well, one of the things he does that I really didn't get to in the lecture today, but is, is I think very significant, is that Isaiah recognizes that a restored earth is critical to the rescue story. Mm -hmm. And so, especially chapter 35, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. It's all about the deserts blooming and the rivers flowing and uh, you know this motif that when the true king arrives, the land will be restored. And this... Mm -hmm. This permeates his book. So he definitely recognizes that a restoration of creation is part of this story. That it's not just fire insurance, as I tell my students. You know, <laughs> It's not just getting you and your kid brother into heaven. This is way bigger than that. So that is definitely in there. He definitely understands that, and he's prophesying it. But again, he's locating it in the story of Israel. So his audience would have been thinking, Oh, so when Israel thrives, all of these things are going to happen. Oh, when we finally get obedient, all these things are going to happen. Oh, when we get the right king on the throne, all these things are going to happen. And I think any informed reading of Isaiah demonstrates that he knows not quite yet. He's watching kings fail in yes. his lifetime, mm -hmm. Ahab and then Hezekiah uh, to, uh, Ahab, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, Ahab and then Hezekiah mm -hmm. to some uh, extent. And well. that first half, you asked this in your first question, the first half about the former things are this interplay between Ahaz, the completely faithless king, and Hezekiah, the almost faithful, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the questions students will always ask is, why do we get to this climactic celebration that Hezekiah has finally gotten it right, and then the last chapter, or the first half of Isaiah, is Hezekiah's failure? Mm -hmm. And I, I think it is exactly that message, that even at our very best, we can't do it. Mm -hmm. even, even the best answer we can offer um, is not enough. And in fact, the introduction ends with that. Like the introduction is all about Israel's sin and then it ends with the calling of Isaiah. <gasps> oh, maybe mm -hmm. that'll do it. And then the Ahaz collapse, Ugh. and there are prophecies about restoration. And then the Hezekiah section, which no, we can't do it. Mm -hmm. So what's he doing? He is interacting with a creation that he knows is a blueprint. He, an eighth century theologian, just like you and I would interact with John Wesley or John Calvin or with Athanasius or um, you know, choose your church father. He's pulling this material that he knows is a blueprint for both the identity of his people and the plan of his God. He's pulling it into his place and he's, he's starting to push on it and trying to communicate this final plan with that in the backdrop. Yeah. So, but you were also yeah. asking about, okay, what about the polemic with the idol and the image? Yeah. I, I'm interested in hearing what you heard in that lecture about, because he, what he's doing, he's working a lot with the image of God, right? And he definitely recognized that as a big part of the plan and largely because he's trying to call Israel to rise to the standard, right? Mm -hmm. He's pointing out to them where they failed to be the image of God. He's calling them to rise up and be the image of God, recognizing that they're not gonna succeed, and then offering the ultimate solution. Yeah, isn't, isn't the seduction for Israel 
looking at the nations around them that are one up mm -hmm. on them, both Assyria and, you know, seeing the future Babylon as well. Mm -hmm. And these nations are guided by, uh, you know, deities ultimately who mm -hmm. are calling the shots, who are represented and embodied in these statues. So mm -hmm. the seduction for an Israelite is to think, well, Yahweh looks like he's, you know, been trumped here. Do, you know, do we need to look elsewhere for our, you know, place mm. of salvation? And well, and all we have is an empty room, right? We have the Holy of Holies. Yeah. And there's, you know, yeah. th there's no big fancy statue in there. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas the Babylonians and the Assyrians do. So you're thinking that they were in part lured by the, the religious and cultural norms of their neighbors just have status mm. on top of everything else. Is yeah. that what you're... Yeah, it would be a temptation to look elsewhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm. And so, you know, what Isaiah says is those idol statues are as blind and deaf mm -hmm. as the, you know, the failing servant is mm -hmm. uh, from, well, actually starting in chapter mm -hmm. 6 with Isaiah's call. Mm -hmm. And keep on preaching to people who will not see and yeah, will not hear. Right. That's just what I wanted to hear, you know, at, at my ordination ceremony. I want to hear that my, <laughs> my calling is going to be completely going useless. <laughs> right. You know, here we, here we put this certificate in your hand at the age of 27 and say, go fail and fail yeah. well. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so what, I, what uh -huh. I really appreciated in what you presented in your lecture this afternoon mm -hmm was the contrast between the ideal servant mm -hmm. who represents Israel corporately mm -hmm. set over against the nature of the idols. And I, you know, for the benefit of those who are watching this, I'd mm -hmm. like to hear you, you know, sort of encapsulate that sort in, of for us again. Yeah, it was, okay. it was good. So I, I made the point in the lecture that, I, you know, Isaiah's got this enormous book, but there is a drama being played out, especially in the latter half of Isaiah, between um, the villain who is not obviously a villain and a hero who has not yet been recognized as a hero. Mm -hmm. And the villain is the idol, which, as we discussed at length, is this animate incarnation of another deity. And when I start using those words, Christians always perk up, right? I, incarnation, animate, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. And of course, that's exactly what the idol is, to everyone's great surprise, that the idea of an incarnation did not start with um, John chapter 1, you know, that this right. is actually a very ancient idea. Mm -hmm. um, so we set this character, the idol, who is a liar and a villain and a thief, and um, what do the literary types call him? A seducer mm -hmm. against the true hero of the book of Isaiah. And there are many heroes in the book of Isaiah. This is a very big book, right? Hezekiah is a hero. Isaiah himself is a hero. Mm -hmm. um, but the great hero is the servant who shows up in the servant songs and stands as the foil, the counter character to the idol. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that the order of Isaiah's book is asking is the question, who will you serve? You know, where is your allegiance going to go? Are you going to throw in your lot with the idol, which apparently Israel already had, or are you going to dare to trust in the servant? Hmm. And he, he picks up that same thing. Gosh, you know, Emmanuel, right? Ahaz's great collapse. The question is, will you believe in the Assyrian Empire? And Ahaz is busy formulating an international treaty to cover his back door with the Assyrians? Or will you trust in Emmanuel, God with us? And this question gets posed over and over again in the book. But the one we're talking about is the idol versus the servant. So, so, in, so back to a mm -hmm. question Joel had asked earlier mm -hmm. about the role of Isaiah's doctrine of creation vis-a-vis mm. -vis these idols. Because yes. th throughout those sections you get you know, this back and forth between extolling Yahweh as creator, mm -hmm. and then there are these do-nothings, non-entities, yes. effectively. Would you mm -hmm. talk about that contrast? What the idol is. Is yeah, that the contrast? what you're Yeah, okay. and then over against the character of Yahweh, who's the true creator. Okay. Um, good, uh, good point. So I would say the thesis of Isaiah's presentation of these two characters is that the only true creator is Yahweh. All of these other gods are pretenders. Mm -hmm. 
and they haven't created anything, and he has created everything. And everything they claim to have created, he's actually going through his, you know, did that on Monday, did that on Tuesday, took care of that one on Wednesday, they're liars. So that's a big thesis, but then we get to this animate incarnation, the statue that is the idol in the ancient world. And I would say that the, the critique almost shifts at this point, because now it's not, about, it's not about the god, it's about the image of the god. And this goes back to that first question, what does Isaiah contribute that nobody else does? Isaiah, in his theological acumen, sees that the animate incarnation of Baal, the animate incarnation of Shamash, is nothing more than a dead statue, a god made in the image of man. Mm -hmm. And he argues back that what Israel must be and what the servant is going to help them be is they must be the truly animate image of the creator. Mm -hmm. And that the redemption story is not over until Adam is back in the garden and humanity has reclaimed their role as the animate, living, breathing, selim image of the Almighty in the restored garden. And somehow or another, Isaiah actually sees both poles. Mm -hmm. And of course, our New Testament writers pick that up and go crazy with it. They see it. We have trouble seeing it, but they see it. Isaiah's Eden, you know, he uses Eden mm -hmm. you know, in the vision of the new creation as, mm -hmm. you know, as a way of clearly bringing us, if, if you missed it up to this point, yes. you know, yeah. here it is, <laughs> you know, don't yeah. miss this word. And, yeah. you know, that you're always bringing us back. And this whole idea of rebirth being necessary is, yeah. is all over Isaiah. That last chapter, 66, can a land be born in a single day? Mm -hmm. And he uses uh, the imagery of a woman in birth, which uh, in the process of birth, which is used a number of times. Partly because, you know, in the Iron Age, birth was not something that happened in a sterile hospital room, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Smith was having her baby uh, three walls away, and you could hear her oh, screaming yeah. through the process. So, you know, everybody has observed birth one way or another. So he uses the image in chapter 66, she has delivered before she has travailed. Is this possible? Mm. The child is born, um, uh, it's a son, it's healthy, and we celebrate that. And then the prophet sort of turns and talks about the child itself thriving and being loved and having its right place in the world. Mm. You know, and this is all this image of Israel being born again, even without the agonies of birth. Can we uh, explore mm -hmm. a, a little bit? We, you've talked about uh, how Yahweh is creator undergirds what he's going to do for Israel mm -hmm. in a restoration of the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I'm not mistaken, uh, Yahweh is extolled as the creator of the ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. And in that context, we have Isaiah's vision for the nations yes. as well. Yes. Could you oh, absolutely. unpack that for us? So again, in Isaiah's immediate space, he is looking at a nation that is failing at its covenant, is going to wind up captured by its enemies, dragged off as refugees, and the world will assume that they're gone, right? And this is done, this story's over. And miracle of miracles, Isaiah 43, um, I'm bringing them home. And I'm gonna march, I, Yahweh, I'm gonna march on Babylon. I'm going to bust down the gates of Babylon, I love to preach it, I'm gonna bust down the gates of hell itself, yeah. and I'm bringing my people home, right? Where there was no highway, I'm making highways. So yeah. this is his immediate scenario. Um, and uh, speaking about the resurrection of a nation. And in that, again, interacting with these other narratives. I've forgotten the second half of your question. Well, the, oh. Where does Isaiah take this in terms of what this new creation is doing for the nations? Oh, outside yes, of yes. In other words, he was, he's rescuing Israel, mm -hmm. and we see that, and he's the creator mm -hmm. who gave them birth, and mm -hmm. now he's going to you know, rebirth them, or mm -hmm. however you'd want to say it. Yeah. But the same Yahweh who created the ends of the earth mm -hmm. is going to rescue the ends of the mm -hmm. earth. So yeah. 
How you does just, that work? Yeah. Um, I love this about the light to the nations and the message of the restoration mm -hmm. of the nations because um, Isaiah is busy preaching it to Israel mm -hmm. that this was your job. You forgot it. Basically, you got, you got so wrapped up in building a nation, mm -hmm. building a building, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm making connections. <laughs> um, taking care of your own populace, uh, maintenance mentality, uh, defending yourself against your foes that you forgot to I, be. I don't see how that could be nation. applicable today I, at all. I know. How could that possibly be? <laughs> so they lost their vision, right? But he restates it over and over again that this was Isaiah, this was Israel's job. So now, when he throws it into the larger canonical context, he brings us back to Adam and Eve. You were created to be the reflection of me to the world. Hmm. Brings it to Israel. You were created to be the reflection of me to the world. And he starts talking about light, the light to the nations, because now we're in a dark place. Mm -hmm. right? We didn't have to talk about light to the nations in Eden, but we do hmm. in Israel. And it's, it's all over the text. Hmm. And... Um, uh, constant, there's this constant reminding that when you finally get back to being who you were called to be, you will then be a light to the nations, and the nations will flood into Jerusalem to worship me because of who you are. Hmm. Right? This is all over the book. Now the New Testament writers pick it up, and they start quoting all of the servant oracles hmm. that speak about how the servant was be, to be a light to the nations, Jesus, of course, picks this up and says, I am the light of the world, and uh, rehearses his identity, which Isaiah would have said is the identity of the servant, as the light to the nations. And then as Jesus is ascending to heaven, basically, he says, oh, and by the way, guys, yeah, here's, here's the job description. Um, you are now the light of the world. Don't blow it the way Israel did. Yeah. Hmm. So that, that makes me think about the servant language in Isaiah as well that shifts from the, this uh, uh, singular, really, mm -hmm. in the early chapters where we have the ideal servant oracles. Mm -hmm. And then chapter 56, it shifts to plural. Yeah. So that, the, the, you know, there's the ideal servant, but that mm -hmm. doesn't let us off Israelites the off the hook. Mm -hmm. And that, that seems to, you know, be backdrop to what you just said. And we, we talked about this in the Q&A too. The thing that, and, and again, I mean, this is very much a Christian lens, right, on this read. Sure. But the fact that we go from Israel as Yahweh's servant, who has so completely blown it, right? And it, by the time you're done with the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, you're like, okay, just shoot me. You know, I, I can't take it anymore. Um, so completely blown it. And then every once in a while it's interrupted with an oracle about how my servant will be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's an interchange. And is it rhetoric or is it theology? Between a plural servant and a singular servant. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. And we, you know, we wind up with this enigmatic, mysterious figure in the servant songs who- Who is this? Who is an individual, but every once in a while we're hearkening back to the plural. So how can the servant be both one person and many people? And my heart sings when I think about that because he is Adam, you know? Mm -hmm. This is the whole point of the incarnation, mm -hmm. that he is the firstborn of many brethren. This is not just about him succeeding. Mm -hmm. This is about him as the tight man, the embodiment of the people of God mm -hmm. succeeding. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about how uh, creation informs mm -hmm. Isaiah's theology, um, but recreation, as, as come up in the conversation, is mm -hmm. another recurring theme. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when Isaiah depicts what life is going to be like for the inhabitants on God's holy hill, mm. uh, he, he says that the wolf will dwell with the lamb yeah. and the leopard will lie down with the young goat. Mm -hmm. What's that depicting there? Mm -hmm. What is that? Well, there, there are people out there that think that the recreation is actually going to um, execute some sort of major 
biological shifts so that wolves don't eat lambs anymore. I'm, I'm not of that opinion. I think that it is um, intentional hyperbole. Hmm. Uh, and I, I joke with my students about this all the time because when they come in as freshmen, they always say, well, we don't want to read the Bible just literally. And I said, oh, no, no, no. You do want to read your Bible literally. Hmm. You want to always, always read the Bible literally. And they're looking at me. Hmm. And I say, you want to read it literally as history writing, literally as poetry, literally as song, literally as hyperbole, literally as metaphor, right? Yeah, that was the way the early church fathers all the way through always understood literal as in incorporating all of those stylistic Genres. devices. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That so, helps yeah, me. Yeah, keep going. Because I'm not, I'm, I'm not a patristics person. That yeah. helps me. I'm not either, but uh, I've read enough to have seen them. Moonlight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You moonlight yeah, patristics. Yeah, yeah. So keep going. Okay, okay. So I think it's hyperbole. I think what it is communicating is, um, what it, it's Isaiah 11, isn't it, where that occurs? And the, I think so. And the other passage is that the, um, uh, the spirit will, oh shoot, I've lost the quote. As the waters cover the sea, um, I think it's the spirit will cover the earth. I've got it wrong, but it's close. Um, Is it the knowledge of the Lord? The knowledge of the Lord yeah. will cover the earth the way the water covers the sea. Yeah, well, we, we do, do have our we Bibles. do have Bibles. We've okay. got Isaiah six there, and it's Isaiah six. Um, when in doubt, consult the text. Right. Anyone find it yet? Well, it's uh, one uh, reference to that is in Isaiah's vision of the Yeah, so the 11, temple. it's 11 and 6. The wolf will live with the lamb, mm -hmm. the leopard lie down with the goat. Nothing will hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain for the waters, for as the waters fill the sea, oh, so the earth good. will be filled. It's the knowledge of the Lord. Yeah, interesting. Hmm. I've got more of a paraphrase over here. Okay, oh. so I think it's hyperbole. I think that it is hyperbole that indicates... Um, such profound peace that uh, there's uh, utter security for all. I wouldn't be at all surprised if in Isaiah's mind, when he speaks of wolves, he actually is thinking Assyrian Empire. Mm. Um, and when he thinks of lambs, he's thinking about the flock of David. Uh, mm. So that, that's what I think he's communicating. And when I teach this book, uh, a, ma a major just you, you cannot do the book without the backdrop is the Neo-Assyrian Empire. Mm -hmm. The most brutal empire, I think, ever to walk the earth. Yeah. They majored in terrorism. Mm -hmm. Their goal was to so um, traumatize their victims that no one would ever dare revolt again. Mm -hmm. And they advertised it in image and in word. Uh, they would brag in their royal annals that they had so terrified their opponent that uh, the opposing king had lost control of his bowels. Yeah. They would actually brag about this in <laughs> royal inscriptions. Um, and yeah, you have to be really, really scared yeah. to lose control of your bowels. So they were, um, they were monsters. Mm. And all of this is playing in the background with mm. Isaiah. And all of the messianic oracles, the prince of peace, mm. um, it's against this backdrop. In fact, even the word for prince is an Akkadian loan word, um, which I think is this beautiful reversal that you have been oppressed and abused and um, beaten and traumatized by people who call themselves prince. Let me introduce to you the Prince of Peace. It's helpful to observe in chapter 11 that you're referring to that that chapter culminates in the the redemption of Assyria in the, yes. in the nations that he's mm -hmm. you know he's there's not only judgment but ultimately you know the full these, restoration you know horrific carnivores mm -hmm. uh, symbolizing nations they actually are restored mm -hmm. uh, so the context context supports what you're saying mm -hmm. even in that chapter so one of the uh one of the curious things about coming to Isaiah, <clears throat> and I, we in the 21st century West uh, don't practice idolatry. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, we think I we don't. I, or we <laughs> think we don't. Uh -huh. At least we didn't, 
uh, I didn't go to a Miss P ritual last mm -hmm. weekend no. uh, and okay. to see Ball incarnate. Mm -hmm. um, so, did you go no. to the Super Bowl? Just <laughs> <laughs> oh, when, man. when they elevated the deities on the platforms and and the oh, fireworks boy. went up. Go ahead. Mm. Sorry. Well, <laughs> joking. So, um, cut that out. <laughs> one of the things you mentioned in your lecture was uh -huh. uh, your concern about, um, on the one hand, letting Isaiah. Um, be something of a strange text mm -hmm. and recognizing that at least the way that they practiced idolatry isn't mm -hmm. the same as uh, what normally goes under the heading of idolatry mm -hmm. in uh, contemporary Christian uh, popular literature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So could you unpack that a little bit more for me? Yeah. Um, I, and I, an important aspect of Isaiah's dialogue with creation, again, as, as we've tagged, it's about what the image of God actually is. First of all, it's, a, it's who the creator actually is and what his image is supposed to be. And I think Isaiah's preaching point would be, you have profoundly misunderstood what the image of God is and how it's supposed to function in this created world. So that would be a major thesis for him. And that misunderstanding, of course, is that these humans, rather than recognizing themselves as made in the image of God and animated by God himself to be the image, have instead turned their energies toward creating their own gods, animating those gods, and placing responsibility on those ritually animated statues for saving themselves. And of course, as we talked about in the lecture, Isaiah is all over this saying, you know, what kind of stupid are you that you can think a statue can actually save yeah. you, right? But your point about, okay, so what is idolatry then? What is idolatry in Isaiah's world? Yeah. What would idolatry have been in the garden even, because he's interplaying with that narrative, and what is idolatry right now? I can say very clearly that in Isaiah's world, it was building an incredibly beautiful, ornate, resource exhaustive statue and then ritually animating it as a, a focus of worship. But that is a reflection of what, if we had idolatry in the garden, what it would have been as well. Because we go back to the original narrative of rebellion. And what is the narrative about? Yahweh offers Adam and Eve perfection. He offers them every wish, every hope, every relationship, and I am of the opinion that Adam and Eve would have been, had traveled to Mars in six months and their ever expanding universe would have been their intellectual playground for the rest of eternity. You know, I don't think this is about fig leaves and, and fruit, you know, for the rest of eternity. This was people created in the image of God who were supposed to be creative and imaginative and builders. And, mm -hmm. But as I, I say in Epic of Eden, it would have been a situation where progress did not necess necessitate pollution, expansion didn't require extinction. Hmm. This would be a world without greed, envy, or malice. Hmm. I can't even get my brain around it, right? So what was, I, what was idolatry in the garden? It was that moment when Adam and Eve were asked, are you in? Do you want this? Hmm. The only requirement is that I stay God and you stay image. I'm the original, you're the copy. My very character defines what is good and evil and you submit to those boundaries. And Adam and Eve said no. They said, basically, we want to create God in our own image. We do not want God creating us in his. That's the crime of the garden. That's the crime that Isaiah is rehearsing. This is what the salvation event reverses. Because the second Adam comes and he buys for us the opportunity to make Adam's choice again. And so when the individual is asked, do you believe in Jesus? Do you repent of your sins? What do we ask them to say? Jesus be Lord of my life, which is the exact opposite of Adam's choice. Mm. So I think that idolatry in this current age is best defined as the exact same crime. 
Where is it in your life that you are recreating God in your image as opposed to letting him recreate you in his? And I think that's the essence of idolatry. And I think we cheapen the crime of idolatry when we say, oh, well, football is my God, or money has become my God, or, you know, fill in the blank. Hmm. There, there's some precedent for that in the New Testament, but I worry yeah. that we undermine this essential crime of humanity. Yeah. It's, it's, it's deeper in our psyche, our, our making of idol. Mm -hmm. uh, than just our recreation, mm -hmm. you know, for example, or if, toys if, that we buy. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's far more subtle than mm -hmm. that. I think, I think you're right. And when we think about the task of sanctification, regardless you know, if you're on the Reformed end or the Arminian end, the, mm -hmm. the whole function of sanctification is that we become conformed to the image of the Son, right? right? right. That is a long obedience in the same direction. That's what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. Well, what happens if we redefine what the end goal is? What happens if we recreate the sun in our image? So instead of being conformed to the creator's image, we are busy conforming ourselves to an image of our own making. What happens to us? What happens to the church? What happens to our witness to the nations? And I would think that Isaiah would say, it all becomes twisted, blind, deaf. Um, the very force that's supposed to change this universe now becomes salt that's lost its flavor and a light that doesn't shine. Well, while we're in Genesis 3, can we mm -hmm. pick up one piece of that and carry mm -hmm. it into Isaiah again to see what Isaiah is doing? I'm thinking of the serpent. Mm. and Leviathan? But, uh -huh. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so you know where my brain's already going here in the, in, the, in the serpent elite dust even in one mm. phrase. So mm -hmm. would you uh, sort of carry that out for us out of 27 and 51? Thank you, because I was thinking, I think Leviathan is in the little apocalypse, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, 24 to 27. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, Isaiah pulls what many would call a mythical figure mm -hmm. um, and has him defeated. Hmm. And it is... It's, it's part of what we we're talking about, the Q&A, that the day of Yahweh is not just about rescuing the oppressed and the marginalized. It's also about slaying the oppressors and defeating the opponents of God's people. And Leviathan, um, I, I think it's actually Everbeck makes an argument yeah. for connecting yeah. the snake with Leviathan yeah. and does a lovely job of it, if yes. I remember correctly. Um, that this enemy must be defeated for the new heavens and the new earth. Yeah. Well, in the words of Revelation, if the gates are going to stand open day and night, the Le Leviathan's got to got to come down. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Is that what you would do with it? it? Yeah, yeah, I was thinking because in twenty Isaiah twenty four, you know, you get the you know unleashing of God's wrath, sort of undoing creation. Mm -hmm in all the earth, and then in chapter 27, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, that's not just enough. There's something that is sinister and evil that, you know, that has wreaked its chaos on the planet, and, mm -hmm. he, and he needs to deal with that. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, in chapter 51, uh, the image comes up again under the language of Rahab and the sea, and mm -hmm. the one who defeats it's the arm of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Which brings us to chapter 53. Ah, you know. to whom has the arm of the Lord yeah. been revealed? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, mean, I was thinking of what you're, mm -hmm. you know, what you're talking about, you know, and this is where that thought came to me when mm -hmm. I was listening to you uh, talk about the suffering servant uh, who is really the agent of this entire mm -hmm. restoration, mm -hmm. and he is the arm of the Lord mm -hmm. who is named in chapter 51 as the one who will defeat Rahab. Mm -hmm. And this interesting juxtaposition, too, of this servant who appears so weak. Yeah. And in reality, you know, this, this, this phrase that's used of every one of, of Yahweh's greatest victories, the extended right arm, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, it's an image coming out of Egyptian iconography that yeah. anytime Pharaoh's winning, his right arm is out. Yeah. And it means that all is right in, in the land of 
military conflict. I'm thinking about Isaiah 43, when Yahweh announces, I'm coming for you, and meaning I'm coming to Babylon, and I'm bringing you home. And he speaks about the right arm of the Lord has accomplished this, which is, I mean, it's a smaller enemy, right? Because all of this is this typological layering, yeah, right? Babylon symbolic of... Babylon comes down, the Leviathan comes down, mm -hmm. sin, death, and the curse comes down. I want to be a part of that story. I want to be on the right side of that story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you want the arm uh, not coming at yes. you, except in redemption to, you know, to take you up uh, yeah. in his bosom. Yes. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for your time. Oh, absolutely. Sandy. It was Thank great you. having you. Um, it's great to be a part of this conversation. What fun.